Good evening um, and welcome to the PLOW event, What Prison Does to Children. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm uh, very honored to be joined by Ashley Lucas, um, who is a professor at the University of Michigan and author of the uh, lengthy essay, um, The End of Rage, which is a profile of Russell Maroon Schultz and, um, and his family during his 49 year incarceration. Shaka Senghor, who is the author of um, the New York Times bestseller, Writing My Wrongs and the just released letter. to the Sons of Cisco and John Clare, Chief of Police of Marion, Virginia. Um, so Shaka once wrote, when someone goes to prison, their family goes with them. Um, and tonight, and that's uh, largely invisible um, to a lot of people who are outside of that experience, but tonight we're here to hear from um, several people who have lived through it from one angle or another and discuss their experiences. So we're gonna hear from each of them for a few minutes um, and then a discussion and feel free to shoot some questions in the chat and we'll hope to um, include those later on in the night. Um, so Ashley, um, Thank you so take it away. Thank you, Katrin. I'm, I'm honored to be here tonight and in such esteemed company. Katrin was the editor who shepherded my piece about Russell Maroon Schultz through nine months of very intensive writing. And uh, Shaka Senghor and Chesa Boudin are both dear friends of mine and people I have long admired. And I'm so honored to get to meet and know John Clare and his work. Uh, it's, it, it's a great thing to be here with all of these people tonight, but I am also very conscious of those who cannot be with us this evening, specifically Russell Maroon Schultz, who passed away in December, and, um, and members of his family who may not be able to join us this evening. I'm also very conscious of the great many people who would love to be a part of this conversation who are sitting inside prisons all over the world tonight who would bring so much to this conversation and to all that we have to share. So please hold all of those folks in your heart as we continue tonight. Um, I wanted to start just by telling you a little bit about Russell Schultz and the, the life that led him to some fame and, um, and, and to some very, very difficult circumstances. So he was a Black Panther at one point. He was also a leader in his community in Philadelphia. He formed a number of organizations, including the Black Unity Coalition, uh, which predated the Black Panther chapter in Philadelphia. He eventually became more and more radicalized as he believed that he needed to fight for the freedom and um, liberty of Black people in the city of Philadelphia. And he eventually became a member of the Black Liberation Army. So the events that really catapulted him into a very different life occurred on August 29th, 1970, when he and a group of other men who were involved in the BLA, the Black Liberation Army, were involved in the shooting of two police officers, Sergeant Frank Von Collin, who died, and Patrolman James Harrington, who lived. At this time, Russell had been estranged from his wife, Thelma, they were no longer living together and she was raising their four children on her own. He also had three children with another woman who was involved in the Black Liberation Army. And for a time he was living with them and then for a time he was underground and on his own. So after that shooting in 1970, a, an FBI squad arrived at Thelma Schultz's home looking for her husband and they came in with guns drawn, demanding to know where he was, searching her house. She's got all of these small children. And that this was the first that she had heard that her husband was wanted by the government or wanted in connection with a violent act. And she was so terrified that when the FBI finally left without finding him because Russell was not in the house, Thelma collapsed against a wall um, because she was so terrified and shocked by what had happened. And that was just the beginning of the extraordinary police and FBI and SWAT team involvement in her life for the decades to come and in the lives of her children. So Russell was on the run. He was hiding uh, underground for two years before he was picked up by the police in connection with a robbery um, that he was suspected of in, in 1972. So he was 
out, but not um, on anybody's radar for a couple of years. Once he gets arrested in 1972, they figured out very quickly what his actual identity was, and he entered the Pennsylvania prison system and would not again emerge for the next 49 years, uh, with the exception of two brief successful escapes from Pennsylvania prisons. But in those 49 years that he was in prison, his wife lived nearly half a century, as did his children. And they experienced their entire childhoods and adolescence and the vast majority of their adulthoods during his incarceration. They were not doing this in isolation. They were still living in the city of Philadelphia where Russell Schultz's name was notorious, where people around them, people in their neighborhood and beyond knew what had happened, had seen all the news stories about the police shootings and Russell Schultz's involvement. Um, they endured extraordinary scrutiny from the community and a whole lot of police involvement. So there was an episode where uh, after one of his successful escapes, the police and the FBI were searching for Russell Schultz and they came to Thelma's house again. Thelma's house was across the street from the elementary school that her children attended. And when the SWAT teams came, they also alerted the school and they told everybody to get out of the school and get onto the school yard. So all of the children and teachers at the school, including three of Russell Schultz's children, are trapped behind a fence in a schoolyard, not allowed to leave, not allowed to go home. And they're watching the SWAT teams push past Thelma, guns are drawn into her house, searching for a man who is not there. And they're watching Thelma scream, her children are, are seeing their mother be exposed to this extraordinary um, search that was conducted in a, in a very violent manner. Many things in the house were destroyed during the search. The family cat was almost shot and killed because they believed that the, the noise coming from a closet was Russell rather than the cat. And uh, the children watched in terror while all of this happened. And then for many years to come, everybody in the neighborhood had seen this as well and knew what happened and didn't want their children to be associated with this family. Um, Teresa Schotz, the eldest of the Schotz children, had to move schools several times. She endured severe harassment by teachers. She had a host of medical problems, including anxiety and eczema that dogged her because of all of the stress of what had happened to her family. Beyond this, Russell Schultz spent nearly 30 years in solitary confinement while he was in prison, 22 of them consecutively. And during those 22 years, during all 30 of the years that he was in solitary confinement, his family had far more limited access to him than they had when he was in the regular prison population. It's hard enough to get to somebody you love when they're in prison. It's a whole lot harder when that person is in solitary confinement. And so his children had very, very little opportunity to know their father. I had the blessing of being 15 years old when my own father entered prison. And so I knew who he was and I loved him for who he was. I already had that relationship, but the Schultz children didn't get that opportunity. They had to learn who their father was through extremely mediated and difficult to attain visits through phone calls um, where you can sometimes hear the staff breathing while you're, uh, while you're on the phone. And all of these processes are very expensive to drive to a prison in the middle of nowhere in the Schultz family's case, often in the mountains of Pennsylvania in a very rural place was a huge financial, emotional and uh, time consuming undertaking each time they went to go to see him. So the, the impacts on the Schultz family were immense and uh, Russell Schultz III, the son of Russell Schultz, who was in prison, bore his father's name and grew up as a black man in Philadelphia and was many times stopped by the police who knew his name and was roughed up by the police on multiple occasions, thrown in the back of vans for nothing more than a traffic stop because the police were taking out something on him that had to do with his father. Uh, now all of the Schultz children are in their 50s. And many of them have children of their own who have also endured the generational trauma of not really knowing their grandfather. Uh, when I finished writing this piece that was published in Plow Quarterly about the Schultz family, Russell Schultz was still in prison. He remained so for about five more weeks after the article was published. Um, the article 
worked in concert with a number of activist ex efforts that had been happening for decades to lobby for his freedom. Um, he had stage four colorectal cancer and was uh, in hospice care at the time of his release. And um, he lived in freedom for about 52 days before he succumbed to his cancer uh, in December of 2021. So the Schultz family and even the Schultz grandchildren, the Schultz children and their children spent many decades in courtrooms, lobbying for his freedom, organizing rallies, doing fundraising, doing public campaigns to try to get the world to know what had happened to Russell Schultz and how he had been tortured in prison because he was on multiple occasions. Um, so their, their whole lives were built around talking about a man to whom they had very little access. And I will, I will stop there having given as much of a portrait as I can in a short amount of time um, of this family and, and what prisons and, and extreme police involvement have done to them. But I, I also want to say that the Schultz family's experiences are just one extreme example of what all of us who have loved one in prison go through. That everybody who loves somebody who lives inside the walls is in some sense completely shaped by a world to which you have no access. A world that you can never fully see unless you are incarcerated yourself. And at this point, we still have over 2 million people in prisons in the United States alone. So this is a whole lot of families, a whole lot of people who are, are living in a state of disconnectedness with a prison wall sitting in the middle of their family. And I ask you all, as we have this conversation tonight, that you hold all of those people and those families' experiences in your hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Shaka, you lived this um, from the other side. Your son was born just after you went to prison and he um, grew up and came of age um, just in time for you to get out. And during that whole time, you were very focused on trying to build a relationship with him um, to the best of your ability. So tell us what that was like. Thank you so much for uh, asking and thank you all so much for having me here. I'm really excited about this conversation and honored to be in a conversation. You know, what's, really, what's always been really important to me, especially as a dad, is to be accountable and responsible for decisions I made, albeit uh, those decisions were made when I was a kid myself. And it wasn't until this conversation that I even thought of the fact that I was a kid going into a prison system while simultaneously being a father uh, to a kid who was left, you know, as a result of me going into the prison system. And, you know, listening to Ashley and, uh, you know, just thinking about everyone who's joining the call and interested in this conversation. You know, one of the things I've always thought about is the impact that incarceration not only has on the individual, but that it has on families and, you know, subsequently uh, that it has on society when you have those voids that are left behind when people are uh, incarcerated. And, you know, growing up in that environment, you know, I went to prison when I was 19 years old. Um, I was convicted of second degree homicide. That was a result of an unfortunate chain of events, um, including my own shooting and a drug deal that went horribly wrong. And it's, you know, it's, when, I, when I reflect on where I'm at today, you know, that's a part of me that will never go away. You know, the prison sentence has been served, uh, but the lifelong sentence of realizing that I've devastated a family, um, including my own family, but also David, who demand life I'm responsible for taking, I devastated his family as well. And so, you know, when you think about systems, I think the way that it's been approached is kind of three through uh, three perspectives. One, community safety, which oftentimes doesn't rise as the most important thing, uh, justice, which you know sits next to safety in terms of least important, and punishment. And that punishment often isn't just applied to the perpetrator or the person who's uh, considered uh, as the perpetrator of the crime, it tends to impact family and community. Uh, and I think it's why these conversations are really important. Uh, some people see these conversations as difficult uh, but my hopes is that at some point we get to a space where we see these conversations as honest and transparent, and they're very complex, they're very nuanced, uh, no matter what perspective, what side you sit on, 
what I believe is the great equalizer of all these conversations is our humanity. Uh, and so I try to lead with that through my work and through how I show up as a father, a writer, um, you know, an entrepreneur and a tech exec. So again, thank you all for having me and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Shaka. Um, and Cheza, you two um, have lived, um, have walked this path uh, for your whole life. So tell us what your childhood experience was like trying to get to know your parents um, from a young age as they were incarcerated. Absolutely, Karen. Thank you. And um, really an honor to, to be on this panel um, with the other speakers and to be able to share some of these experiences in the hope of moving forward towards better options and opportunities for the next generation. When, when I was a baby, when I was 14 months old, my parents dropped me off with the nanny the way they did every day. Um, and they went off um, about their business. Um, that day, unlike any other day, they never came back to get me. While I was playing with the nanny, my parents were driving the getaway car in an armed robbery that tragically left three men, including two police officers dead. Both of my parents were arrested that day. My mother ended up serving 22 years in prison. My father served more than 40 years before he was released in November of this past year. I don't remember their arrest. I don't remember who came to get me at the babysitter later that night when my parents never showed up. I don't, I don't remember even when the judge sentenced them to those long prison terms. My earliest memories instead are actually going to visit them in jails and prisons. My memory is begin with lines to get through metal detectors and steel gates, just to be able to see my parents, just to be able to give them a hug. And even before I understood how privileged I was to be a white male heterosexual in this world, I remember noticing that the lines to get into those prisons were mostly black and brown women of color. I remember being acutely aware of the fact that I was one of the only white people often in the visiting rooms. And I remember feeling, as Shaka's written, that I was sentenced to serve that time with my parents. And over the years, now decades, of visiting my parents in prison, I grew and I learned and I evolved. At some point, I went to law school and became a public defender and now have the honor of serving as the San Francisco elected district attorney. Um, I saw that the approach this country takes to crime and punishment is not working. I saw personally and professionally that it's failing to build safety, that it's systematically undermining the things that we know are most important to have safe and vibrant communities. It's failing to rehabilitate people who've committed crimes. It's failing to invest in healing for those who've been harmed by crimes. And it's starving our local governments of the money they desperately need to invest in things like healthcare and education and housing, the kinds of things that make for safe communities where people don't commit crimes. And when I went to law school, I wanted to fight against mass incarceration, right? This system that's led, as Ashley said, to the United States incarcerating more than 2 million people, a system that dwarfs any other country in the history of the world's incarceration rates. And so I became a public defender. And day in, day out as a public defender, I saw individuals in a moment of crisis whose lives were often in my hands fighting to help them navigate their worst mistakes and to have some hope for a future potential, for a recognition that second chances, like the ones I had as a kid, when I grappled with all the anger and the stigma that comes with parental incarceration, the self doubt, the shame the frustration at the choices my parents made, at the horrific costs those choices had on myself, but also on all the other families impacted. I had second chances to overcome the anger and the stigma and the guilt. I had opportunities to learn to forgive my parents and to forgive myself for what they had done. And I was fighting as a public defender to have those kinds of second chances for the people I represented. But I saw day in, day out in the Hall of Justice that we weren't doing justice, we weren't saving lives, we weren't building safety, we were warehousing people. And we were doing it in ways that come at a tremendous social and economic cost that actually are undermining rather than building safety. Because 
we know that more than two thirds of those folks once released after their sentences, without any reentry plan, without any education or rehabilitative services are gonna end up back behind bars within a couple of years. All we're doing is kicking the problem down the road and in the process, we're destroying families like mine and Shaka's and Ashley's, dooming another generation to grow up visiting their parents behind bars with all of the trauma and the increased risk of victimization and of incarceration that come with it. It was in that context that I ran for district attorney. I made three simple promises. First, that we would not rely on incarceration as a primary response to all of the tremendous diversity of social problems that get dumped on the criminal legal system. And second, that we would invest some of the money we save through decarceration and expanding victim services and expanding treatment programs, mental health care and drug treatment, both for those who are victims and for those who commit crimes. And third, that we would enforce the law equally. So it's not just people who look like Shaka who get arrested and prosecuted and jailed and caged, but that we're enforcing laws against corporations that steal billions of dollars from their employees, against police officers when they use excessive or unlawful force, and against politicians and other folks in power who engage in acts of corruption that so damage the public trust. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do. And I just wanna wrap up by, by emphasizing that as someone who even as elected district attorney had to go through prison gates to visit my father just until two months ago, even in this current role, as we prosecute murders and rapes and shoplifting and drug sales and gun possession and everything in between, we often face the very difficult choice about how long to send someone to prison or how long to ask a judge to impose. And in every case, we are asking ourselves, are there alternatives to incarceration that are consistent with justice, that can protect the public, and that can set us as a whole, as a people, as a community up for safety and success in the long run? And I believe that every time we send someone to prison in San Francisco and beyond, it is a reflection of a collective failure, a failure of imagination, a failure of creativity and a failure of prevention. Because as much as some people like to say we should do the crime, do the time, serious, you know, life should mean life, all of those cliches, the fact of the matter is there is nobody who can argue with the fact that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We should not be measuring justice in this country in years of incarceration or in pounds of flesh. We should be measuring it through the investments we make in preventing crime and in meaningfully supporting those who have been harmed by crime. And that has been my priority since day one as district attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Chesa. Um, John, you, like Chesa, are also now involved in this issue from the law enforcement side, um, and you have a certain amount of discretion. Um, although you don't make the laws in, in terms of how you approach it. So, so tell us about your experience. Well, first, I want to say how much I appreciate being a part of the panel. I've been in law enforcement now for just over 20 years. My father was a police officer, and so was his. Um, his father, however, spent a significant time in uh, prison in the late 19th century, early 20th century. So I don't have too many direct connections with prison experience, um, but I certainly believe, uh, just like Chessa said, that there's a certain justice and righteousness involved with uh, losing one's ability to live in a free society as the result of crime. But I also want uh, everyone to know that I'm not here to be the loyal opposition. I recognize uh, great paradoxes in the justice system and with incarceration, rehabilitation, recidivism. And I think these questions plague the conscience of police officers just as much as anyone else. I mean, we, um, no one else is closer to the situation uh, without being a part of it than, than we are. Um, in my own experience, I've always tried to be aware of the negative effect that police contact can have on children. Um, usually those more mature officers try to train younger officers never to embarrass people in front of their family. 
Uh, their family is all that people have. They are kings and queens in those places. And um, we should always try to be respectful of that as much as we can. And in many ways, it's, it's a great de-escalation technique to remove, um, you know, to, to create separation there. So there's not uh, all this trauma that's being experienced by the entire family and, and trying to find ways to reduce that. Um, one of the things I was struck with in Ashley's story was the tension uh, of Russell's son being adopted by Papa Barnes, a police officer. But I think it's a great example of uh, our social and emotional connection to the totality of the events, right? So no individual act of justice can be understood outside of its social context. So everything happens in a particular context, in a particular place with particular people. And, and I think he shows the best of what we hope to be. Um, I've never experienced that or, or been very close to anything like that, um, but, I, but I was involved in a uh, use of deadly force uh, shooting about 10 years ago. Uh, a man had uh, tried to kill his wife and uh, tried to kill several police officers uh, when we attempted to take him into custody, and I was, I was one of them. Uh, he was convicted and, and sentenced to prison, and his son later became a police officer with that very same police department. Uh, so, um, you know, I imagine that same tension is the same tension that exists in Russell's or existed in Russell's life and in his son's lives. Um, and, and I even see those things in casual settings and it's things that we experience. One of, the, one of the things I thought about was how I go out for Halloween to trick or treat. And uh, a lot of the children will be happy to see police officers and I can see the tension in their parents' eyes. And so I just uh, wanted to close with uh, letting everyone know that um, I think the best of our profession, the most conscientious of our profession, uh, completely empathize with uh, the reality of broken families and the perpetuation of it. And the same thing that happens in the law enforcement profession. There's trauma on both sides. My family knows well uh, all the trauma that we go through. And you see, you see this, what seems like an unending perpetuation of it uh, from all sides. And, and I look forward to a time when that isn't so. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, John. Um, and I, I um, hope we do circle back to some of those big picture questions. But first, um, well, and a reminder to viewers that you can post questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as they can. But Shaka, I wanted to go back to you because one thing that really stood out to me in your first book was what a driving force your relationship with your older son was for you throughout your incarceration. He was just about to be born uh, when you went in and uh, when it hadn't quite sunk in how long you were gonna be inside, you're very focused on getting out to be there for his birth and, and be there as his father. And uh, once it became clear that wasn't gonna happen, you had to think of other ways to um, be his father and, and build that bond um, from the separation. And um, there are some really remarkable moments that you describe in your book. And um, I really, it, it seems clear that it makes you think about, he made you think about what kind of man you wanted to be yourself and uh, what kind of man you wanted him to be. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that, that question. You know, I, I think, you know, my story as it relates to, you know, trying to be a father from prison, you know, speaks to this larger issue that, you know, I, I don't think anyone's born to be in prison. And, you know, growing up, I was an honor roll scholarship student. You know, there was a series of things that happened in my life, uh, high levels of adverse childhood experiences very early on uh, from physical abuse in the household to being shot, you know, as a kid, you know, when I was 17 years old. And that trauma was something that I had never even known as being possible to unpack. Like, I didn't know that, you know, instead of going right back to my neighborhood where I got shot at, that I actually should have been ushered into some type of treatment program to address the trauma. I didn't know that growing up in a household where abuse was rampant and, you know, in pretty much a daily reality, that there were safe havens for kids, which is what I sought out when I actually ran away and found myself being seduced into the drug trade. And it's one of the reasons I wrote the, the, the book. I really wanted to give uh, a behind the scenes glimpse into the headlines, you know, so you hear uh, the splashes of, of crime across 
you know, whether it's television or news, uh, but rarely do we get a glimpse into the lives that, you know, in the moments in children's lives that typically shape how, you know, many of us end up traveling that road. And so while I was incarcerated, uh, I spent a total of seven years in solitary confinement, but at one stretch, it was four years straight. And it was during that time that I received this letter from my son who was around 10 years old at the time. And his mom had told him why, why, what I was in prison for. Uh, but I had no context. You know, I didn't know if she said it to him out of anger, if she said it out of frustration, if she said it to kind of scare him down a different path. But I felt this desperation as a dad to save him from the path that I took. You know, I've spent uh, the first part of my incarceration at a prison called Michigan Reformatory. Uh, the nickname was the Gladiator School. And the range of ages was from like 16 to 21. And so, you know, as I was experiencing my life on the inside, I consistently saw young kids coming to prison, serving very lengthy sentences for, a, you know, many different crimes or whatever the case may be. And I didn't want my son to have that experience. And so I knew that uh, one, I owed him a father, but also owed him an example of what, you know, is possible when you step up and accept responsibility, you're accountable, but also you are honest about all the different things that shape the decision you made and that I wanted to give him that more than anything else, you know? And so I worked on myself, uh, did a lot of healing, uh, a lot of journaling, a lot of meditation to really unravel um, you know, the things that had led me down the path. You know, it wasn't until I began to mature in that personal accountability that I began to understand the systemic realities that exist in our community and the areas where things could have been changed and could have been different. Um, and it's what I advocate for now. You know, I think that we're at a, a very critical stage as a society in terms of thinking about what do we do with these systems that have failed us. I mean, prison systems, uh, historically has a 70% failure rate. It means that 70% of the people that walk out of prison end up back into prison. Um, there's no other business model that can fail at that rate and continue um, to be endorsed and encouraged as a, a form of business. So we, we got it wrong. There's tons of things we got it wrong, right? Um, and I think that there's you know an opportunity before us to really start to, to think about those deeper levels. And that's what inspired me to write that specific book, uh, Writing My Wrongs, and to really talk about my experience as a dad behind bars. Chesa, um, what was that like for you being the child in that scenario and um, growing up to learn why your family situation was the way it was and sorting out your feelings towards your parents um, for what they had done um, to place themselves in that position? Look, I mean, in the beginning, it was a sense of confusion. I didn't understand why my parents weren't there. It took time. I was, I think, really lucky in that my entire family and, and support system um, were really honest with me about what happened from day one. But I was 14 months old when my parents were arrested. I, there was no way I could comprehend the gravity of the harm they had caused or of the consequences that had for me in my life. I, I was adopted into another family, friends of my parents took me in as, as one of their three sons. And I was so fortunate to have a stable family life despite my parents' incarceration, to have two brothers who, though not biologically related, stepped up and one of them was three years older than me, one of them was a year older than me and played the role of big brother and supported me through uh, my whole life still to this day. Um, as I started to grapple with, in a conscious way, what my parents had done and, and what it meant for my life, as I visited them from really from day one, um, there were a kind of a evolving series of feelings and emotions. Um, there were times when, you know, if, after a phone call from prison with my parents, I would break down crying and I would I would say to my adoptive parents, if only I could have talked. I would have told them not to go, right? In, in other words, as a kid, I felt that somehow it, it was my responsibility to tell my parents not to participate in this terrible crime. There, there were other times when, when I, would, I would say, and I was lucky to see a therapist as a kid, a child therapist, I would say to him, you know, maybe, maybe if I'd been more lovable, 
they wouldn't have risked losing me. Those feelings of self-blame, of, of stigma, um, of, of, of guilt for folks associated with, for children of people who are incarcerated are really common. And as I got older, I also started to feel like, wait a second, I didn't do anything wrong once I learned that lesson. And once I could forgive myself for not being lovable enough, right? I didn't do anything wrong. Why am I being punished? Because every time I had to get on one of those long bus rides, and I know Ashley knows about the distances traveled by families as well or better than anybody to get to see someone that you care about behind bars. There are big states in this country, Texas, California, the federal system. People have to travel thousands of miles. And every one of those trips, if you are the child or the loved one of someone incarcerated, you're thinking to yourself, why am I being punished? Every time you're getting searched, watching my grandmother be forced to take her bra off because it had an underwire. Every time you're thinking, why are we the ones being punished? They're the ones that committed the crime. And of course, that has consequences. It has consequences for how we think about the world, for how we think about the power of the state, for how we think about our own identities. Um, and I was so fortunate to have the support, as I said, of a stable family, to have the benefits of white skin privilege, to have uh, school and academic tutors who gave me the tremendous support that I needed to catch up with my classmates. I didn't learn to fully read until I was nine years old. And I went on to go to Yale College and be a Rhodes Scholar. Now, that is the potential that I know every single child with an incarcerated parent in this country has, if only they had the supports and the resources and the second and third chances that I was lucky enough to have. And so I, I say, one of the critical questions is how do we make sure that we're not punishing innocent children and families? And second, how do we make sure that we find creative ways to send fewer parents to prison? How do we destroy fewer families? And it's one of the reasons I'll end with this, that one of my very first acts after taking office as San Francisco district attorney was to create a primary caregiver diversion program. Wouldn't have applied to my parents. I'm not talking about murder and armed robbery cases. But when we have nonviolent crimes alleged against people whose primary role should be taking care of and loving and supporting their children, I believe we are all safer. We are all better off and we are doing more justice when we require those folks to engage meaningfully, parenting classes, job training, capacitation so they can play the role we as a society need them to play in their homes with their kids to break the intergenerational cycle of incarceration. So for many families, this is um, a very hidden part of their experience. It's something that they don't want anybody else to know about them. Um, Ashley, you've spoken about how when you were in school, you thought um, for a long time that you were the only person who had an incarcerated family member until one day suddenly finding out, having all these people come out of the woodwork when you started talking about it. And it turns out that everybody that you knew had one, but they just weren't talking about it. So what can we do to um, make these children feel less alone um, and decrease the stigma in, in coming forward about it? It's a tough, tough question. I mean, I one of the reasons why I so love, adore, and admire both Shaka and Chesa is because in their own ways, they helped save me. I spent so much of my father's incarceration trying desperately to understand what had happened to him, but also trying desperately to understand what had happened to me, what happened to my mother and my sister and her children and all of us who loved him. And how do you say to the world at large, this person is a member of my family. He is not dead, but I can't show him to you. And I can't explain all of the contours of how he shapes my life, but I love him. I love him so much. And other people don't get that. A lot of people in my life expected me to be ashamed, expected me to want to hide the fact that he was in prison, wanted to pretend that he was dead. And none of that helped me. I've done a lot of research on the families of incarcerated people. And so many of them tell their children all kinds of tall tales 
to help soften the blow or to, to try to protect them. I believe people often do it because they're trying to protect their children from what they can't grapple with themselves because it's so painful to know that somebody you love that much is in a place that you really don't understand that you can't see, but you know that they're in danger. You know that they are not well. And children, like the rest of us, like adults, need places to talk about these things. And I, Shaka writes so beautifully in his new book, in the, the Letters to the Sons of Society, which all of you, if you don't have a copy yet, you need to buy one right now. Just while you're listening to this talk, get on uh, an independent bookseller website and get yourself a copy of this book because it really, really matters. One of the things that Shaka says in this book that I found absolutely gut-wrenching was to talk about how painful it is to do things like what we're doing tonight, to have to air your trauma in public over and over and over again, because it is so needed, because there are so few places where we can have this conversation safely. I love Shaka and Chesa for their bravery, for their willingness to have had these conversations with me in private and, and in public, uh, for their concern for the children who are all over this country and many others tonight who are enduring these same things, who are looking for voices like ours, who can have this conversation. But every time you gear up to have it, you have to, you have to kind of dig deep and say, is this a thing that I can say in public tonight? And today I'm a little more emotional than I am sometimes when I do this because R Russell Schultz is dead and several people who I really love who ought to be here with us to have this conversation tonight. Um, my dear friend, Patrick Bates, was shot and killed in Detroit very recently and leaves behind three children, including one who is yet to be born. And so these conversations are very present with me. Um, Pat, had, I came to know him while he was in prison and part of the programming that we do with the Prison Creative Arts Project. So his, his story is not just about um, another life lost on the streets of Detroit, but about somebody whose family had already endured the trauma of incarceration and then doesn't get to share that life with him in freedom. Uh, as Russell Schultz's family had only those 52 days. We have done such incredible damage to so many families. And it's so hard to get people to have this conversation. People are so frightened of it. I'm so tired of people at my university, which is the University of Michigan, being scared to have even much lower stakes conversations, like how stigmatizing it is to have a box for felony convictions on uh, admissions applications to the university. We can't even talk about the very practical ways that we continue to shut people out of public life and public culture in the United States, then how in the heck do we expect to help all of these children? I think we have to have this conversation over and over and over again in public places where people can feel safe to tell about the reality of their lived emotional experience and where the first question isn't always, well, what did that person do to end up in prison? For these kids, as Chesa so poignantly described, it doesn't matter. Chesa didn't do anything. Shaka's children didn't do anything. And yet, so often, the first thing that pops out of somebody's mouth is some kind of, however mild, an interrogation about how much that person might have deserved it and how you, as somebody who loves them, and God forbid you should be married to somebody in prison, but you actually chose to love them and weren't just born into it, how guilty you might be by association. That's a terrible thing to do to people. And we don't do it in so many other contexts. Nobody looks at you and says, well, why on earth did your father become a dentist? Why is your father a Republican senator? Nobody says those things with some kind of, of incredible impetus to, to place motivation or blame on other kinds of life circumstances. But if your father is in prison, that question gets asked very pointedly over and over and over again, often in the absence of any question about whether that person is all right, whether you get to see them, whether you have hope of spending time with them at some point soon. And right now, whether or not they are living through the mortal danger of COVID in US prisons, which is something we also cannot ignore that is ravaging families who have a loved one in prison. So I'm sorry if that was a bit more than what you asked me, Katrin, but that's what's on my heart tonight. No, thank you for sharing, Ashley. Um, and as you pointed out, and as John, as you pointed out the other day, um, it's a really, 
unusual thing for people to be able to have these conversations um, with each other and to to air them out because there's such a deep lack of trust now between um, the police force and the communities that, that you're supposed to be protecting. Um, so how have you encountered that and, and how do you approach it? Well, one of the things that I'm really encouraged by is we all seem to agree that there's a system of violence that perpetuates more violence. And, and, and so we have, a, we have violence that occurs in our nation and then that turns into a traumatic violence on families and on offenders and on everybody who knows them. And there seems to be this unending cycle of it. And that should at least give us a starting point. Um, I mean, we're all obviously from very different walks of life on the panel, but we all seem to think that that um, that there has to be some way to put an end to it or at least slow it down or separate it out in some way. And, and I think that's what gives me hope in the conversation. I I'm the kind of police officer that hopes one day and I don't think I'll ever see it, but I hope one day that the police don't have to arrest anybody for anything. Um, that, that we live in a society full of mutual respect and admiration and founded on, uh, you know, I think it was Shaka that talked about the human connection. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things in society today that help dehumanize. Um, uh, part of it is, part of it may even be this context. I, I wish we were all in a room together talking about it so we could uh, see each other and, and hear each other's voices and get a better sense of, of, of who each other are. But um, it seems like everything that we're doing, especially in contemporary society, just continues to contribute to, to the dehumanization. And um, some of the things that, that I've advocated for uh, in, in law enforcement are, are seeing people at that basic human level, understanding that we're really not all uh, that different and, and encouraging conversations. So in 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, um, I spent hours and hours and hours conversing with everyone that I could, because that's ultimately going to be the solution. It's not going to be a bat or a gun or a bomb or anything like that. It's going to be the, the changing of hearts and minds uh, through the renewal of, of wisdom and understanding and, and connecting on those levels. And so um, for as much as law enforcement can play a role especially me as the chief of police, that's what I try to do. Um, and often there's criticism for that, right? Maybe I should mind my own business and uh, go about my daily employments without doing things like this. Um, but I think this is important. I need, to hear, I need to hear the story and I appreciate everything that's been said. I'm a father of four children and I couldn't have imagined not being able to connect with them at the level that I do now. And I can imagine how that alone would be sufficient enough uh, impetus to, to want me to not be in prison anymore. Uh, and I, I remember we were talking the other day, I've never worked in a prison and, and, and frankly, I never would. I respect uh, the people who do, um, but, but the whole thing is, is problematic. And it seems like we all agree that the transmission, I think I heard Chessa say as much and Shaka that the transmission of trauma is what creates more problems. And so what is the paradox of a system that uh, incarcerates people who, who do things because of trauma and then traumatizes their families and, and it becomes this rolling cascade? And, and what does it take to put a stop to that? And I wish I had answers like that, but um, I'm committed to doing to doing what I can, and, and I appreciate uh, hearing the stories tonight. I would love I would love to respond to the chief, um, if 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 I may. So in 2015, I was given an opportunity to go visit uh, some prisons in Germany, and when I first got the invite, my immediate reaction was no. Like, why would I go to Germany given the history? Uh, that I knew about, you know, with the Holocaust, and why would I go to a system that, you know, I imagine to be extremely brutal? Uh, but I decided to go, and when I got there, I was shocked at how they think about criminal justice and how they ensure that the people who are arrested are never disconnected from their family or community, and that they've written it into their constitution in such a way 
that people who are incarcerated actually go back into the community while under their sentence. Uh, they have to have access to their families. They have the type of programming that really nurtures and support their healing because a lot of times what happens, and I, you know, I know you're a chief and you've seen this many times, that oftentimes the arresting officer is meeting someone at one of their worst moments, a crisis moment. And yes. so, you know, it's an opportunity for healing. And, you know, I, I can't wait for you to read the new book. It's, it's really a fascinating thing happened to me when I was writing it. You know, it's a series of letters to both of my sons. So I have one son who was born, you know, shortly after I was incarcerated. And I have, I have a younger son, Sekou, uh, who's 10 years old, he's here now. And he's born, you know, post uh, incarceration. And as I was writing this book, I was just telling stories of things that have happened in my life in the uh, almost 12 years since I've been out. And when I got done and I started rereading the book, I realized I've had five encounters with police and none of them as a result of criminal mischief on my behalf. And out of the five, there was one that resonated with me the most, the deepest. I was in Cincinnati and we were outside of a barbershop. We were giving away money for, you know, this community celebration. And someone called and said, there's a group of black men in front of the barbershop and they're blocking traffic. And up comes this young white officer. And I can see on his face this confusion because he's seen us just having a merry time. And right. I decided to just step up and talk to him and say, hey, you know, how, how's it going? And he was like, you know, it's just one of these calls. It's this, this ridiculous, you know, this is where we're at now. People are just, you know, calling in all these crazy things. So I invited him to come inside the barbershop. He was like, if I come inside, the party's going to go flat. And while this conversation is taking place, I say, well, Jerome Bettis is inside, the, the, the Hall of Fame football player. He thought I was pulling his leg. I was really serious. And so Jerome comes out and the officer says, man, if my dad was here, you know, he would be so excited by this moment. And we all just froze, three men, three fathers, three sons. And we had this moment and a friend of mine shot this photo and I write the story and post it on Facebook and go about my day. I come back, this thing has millions, at this point it's over 18 million you know, shares. And what it said to me is that as a country, we're all yearning for a healing and a human connection. And in most cases, that's how a lot of these interactions go Unfortunately, we don't see that. Um, and tragically, we see far too many of the other versions of George Floyd and things of that nature. But in writing about the book, what I realized that we don't have honest conversations and we don't talk about the dreadful reality that if you're black, brown or poor in this country, that oftentimes your engagement or interpretation of your engagement with law enforcement in these systems is very chaotic, is very violent, is very disconnected from what it means to be a part of society. And what I felt like they did in Germany was they never made a distinction between those who ran afoul of the law and those who hadn't as being citizens of a country who were all worthy of the resources. And I think these type of conversations that we're having now give us the greatest opportunity to look at other models um, and then employ some of those practices while simultaneously having honest conversations about what we get right, but also what we get wrong. And, you know, I think it's why it's just so important for these platforms. And I'm just, you know, truly honored to be in conversation with you all this evening. Uh, but I really wanted to share that because I think it highlights what's possible for us. No, I appreciate it, Chaka. And I'll tell you, one of the things that, that police officers have started to consciously think about, especially police leaders, is the call you got. Um, and, and, and that call is uh, a perfect example of the type of thing that even we deal with. And so now one of the conversations we had here is we, we need to assess these things, right? Did this person actually describe something illegal? Do we have any indication that anything like that's going on? And if, if we don't show up and we don't see any of that, why don't we just keep driving right by? Because there's no reason to even in, engage in it. But um, unfortunately, not everybody feels that way. You know, I'm sure, as you know, police policing can most often be social refereeing. Uh, you know, too many, too many of my neighbors' leaves blew in my yard, and you know, in the most benign. But but that's what ends up happening. And and we're, we're trying to find ways to 
think better about about those things. And I and I appreciate I appreciate you, Shaka. I appreciate your honesty and um, thank you. Well, so one thing that you all spoke to um, is the generational trauma of all this and how trauma get, begets trauma. But one thing I also do want to point out is that in some cases, trauma um, gives rise to compassion. Um, there's uh, one of my favorite moments in this beautiful essay that Ashley wrote is Teresa, Russell's oldest daughter, um, is reconnecting with him later um, in her life. And um, he actually encourages her to reach out to the kids who, in her school, she's a teacher, um, who had incarcerated parents and that she knew better than anybody um, what they were going through. And so she forms a club for them and then she ends up fostering uh, 28 children. Um, and that was something beautiful that came out of the pain that she experienced and understood. And um, I think that's what each of you um, are, are doing with your lives as well. Um, Shaka, sharing your voice, Ashley, uh, with all the work um, that you're doing and, and Chesa with what you're trying to accomplish um, for families who are going through what you went through as well. Um, and so I just really wanna thank you all um, for being here with us tonight. Um, and uh, if you have any last words, uh, feel free to share. I just wanna echo a lot of the really important points that have been made, uh, just speak to how much I appreciate Shaka and Ashley's writing and the way they've turned their pain into power um, in ways that are accessible to other people. And I want to echo uh, what the chief said, you know, it, we all want to live in a world where we don't need police to make arrests, where we don't need prosecutors to even consider whether, you know, 10 years or 20 years or whether there's some alternative program. We want to live in a world where we don't need any of that because our communities are safe and because people have outlets for their pain and their insecurity and their trauma that don't involve guns or crime. And I think the more we focus on that end goal of, of living in safe, secure communities that ideally don't rely on building prisons or mass incarceration or handcuffs or guns, the safer and the stronger we'll all be. Yeah, I just would like to say uh, congratulations to Ashley for such an incredibly beautiful and important article and for being the incredible professor that walks in uh, with your heart on display and leads through lived experience. Um, you know, and as an advocate for children with incarcerated parents, I'm just thankful for your voice in the world. I am so grateful for each of you and, and for all of the bravery and beauty that you brought to this conversation tonight and that you bring to your lives each day. I am, I am grateful and hopeful about the world, knowing that all of the other people in this call have children of their own who I think they are raising with great love and dignity and respect for human life. And uh, I just hope that all of the children of incarcerated folks and all of the families, all the people who love somebody inside find in this conversation some of the, the comfort, the hope and the grace that I feel in listening to each of you who I admire so much. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to participate and I wish we could probably have this conversation every day for an hour for 10 years and we probably wouldn't cover all the ground, but um, it's a good start and um, I wish all of you well. Yeah, hope to connect with you Chief. We'd love to, to, love to talk further. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I hope that you all um, continue the conversation, buy Shaka's book, uh, read Ashley's article, and thank you so much for joining us tonight.